the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, may the peace and blessings of Allah, the exalted, be upon the Prophet Muhammad and his purified progeny. And may Allah's damnation be upon their enemies. Inshallah ta'ala, let's continue from our last episode. And there's no need for a recap as one can f f uh, go back to the previous episode. So let us, inshallah ta'ala, just play this quick clip. هنا إذا كان كتابيا نخير ثلاثة خيارات إما أن تكون مسلما فإن قبل فلا نأخذ منه الجزية فإذا أصبح لا يصير مسلما يبقى على مسيحيته ومن حقها ما نقول قيمة جزية فإذا رفض الجزية نقاتله أما المشرك نخيره بين الإسلام والقتال هذا الرأي ليس رأي أحمد الحسن بغدادي فالرأي كل المذاهب الإسلامية الخمسة أنت صحفي أما أنا فقير اسمع كلامي إذا كان كتابيا ثلاثة شروط وشرحتها الآن وأما إذا كان مشركا نخيره بين القتال والإسلام Dear brothers and sisters welcome back So you just saw the clip of this person um, who was speaking to a presenter discussing the issue of jizya and a non-Muslim had seemed to have subtitled this So we go into our topic we go straight into it we say that these days we live with people who are of religions which maybe didn't exist at the time of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, and we peacefully coexist with our brothers and sisters in humanity um, for example of the Sikhs, the Hindus and other people maybe Buddhists etc and we live peacefully, we coexist, we may discuss our differences and we don't have any problem really with them maybe just theological differences so we can exist as humans. But in a legitimate Islamic state, the issue comes up that would jizya be accepted for those who are of non-Ahlul Kitab? The famous opinion or mashhur opinion is that the jizya is accepted for the Ahlul Kitab. So the people of the book. And then as we mentioned, there are different definitions pertaining to who are the people of the book. Now, what about the non-Ahlul Kitab? This is something, inshallah ta'ala, that we want to go into and see the opinion of and of course evidences for it. That is it just completely clear that if someone is not from the people of the book, they choose between free options or they choose between Islam or death. Is this something that would happen in a legitimate Islamic state? or if the Muslims had a war, a war started on them from those who are not from the people of the book and they took over that land, would it be that all of them just have the sword or Islam? Inshallah ta'ala we discuss this. Firstly, we go to one book by Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, uh, Rahmatullah Alayh. In the following book, uh, which is called As-Siyaqatul Jadida li Alim al-Iman wal Hurriya so this book, The New World Order, the new order for a world of faith, freedom, prosperity and peace, we find on page 350 to 351 where Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi discusses about the jizya. And what does he say? Inshallah ta'ala we'll go to it. He says that al jizya tu'khath min mutlaq al kafir khilafan lil mashhur fa inna al kuffar alladhina ya'ishuna tahta liwa al islam yu'khath minhum mal la bi'anwan al khums wa al zaka wa inma bi'anwan al jizya sawa kanu ahlu kitab kal yahud wa al nasara wa al majus aw kanu ghayr ahlu kitab kal wathaniyin well, Mushrikeen. So Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi states what on page 350 and page 351 where it starts. He says that the jizya of the people of the dhimma, so Ahl al-Dhimma, the protected people who live under the auspices um, of Islam, this tax is taken from them in the same way that khums and zakat taxes are taken from the Muslims. We have mentioned in our books of jurisprudence that jizya tax is solely taken from the unbelievers contrary to what is widely believed. 
the money collected from the unbelievers who live under the um, province of Islam does not come under the heading of khums or zakat, but rather under the heading of the jizya tax. This applies whether the unbelievers are people of the book, like Jews or Christians or Zoroastrians or the idolaters or the polytheists. So Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi in this book here, he discusses from pages 350 to page 351 that contrary to the famous opinion or the mashhur opinion, he says that jizya can in fact be taken from those who are actually non Ahlul Kitab. He says all of the non believers have an option of paying the jizya and coexisting peacefully with the Muslims in a legitimate Islamic state. So this is one opinion that he gives because as we said some of the ulama and I believe including him as well are of the opinion that within the time of the Ghayba an Islamic state can be established but it would be under the shura of the fuqaha, the council of jurists. There are other ulama say that no this is not allowed completely until the reappearance of the Imam. But I myself personally am not saying I subscribe to any opinion. I am just giving both of the opinions. So for English readers, obviously this book is in Arabic, but there have been texts here and there and concise, nice books of Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi which have been translated. For example, the first one for the English readers is if Islam were to be established. And on page 33, I believe it is, Imam uh, sorry, Say Muhammad Shirazi, he discusses this point of jizya being a tax that can be accepted from the believers as a whole, the non-believers as a whole, the disbelievers, and is not just restricted to Ahlul Kitab. What he states here is that they pay jizya tax in exchange for protection they receive from the Islamic head of state for their lives, wealth, family, just as Muslims pay khums, zakat, taxes. And he says the Islamic government consists with minorities peacefully. Minor minorities have rules and laws specific to them, whether they are religious minorities such as Christians or Jews, or the minorities such as Buddhists, um, etc. And he says that just as the Messenger of Allah treated the pagans of Mecca, where he did not force any one of them to convert to Islam after the Fath, the fall of Mecca. So. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he didn't force any of them. This is one of the points that he mentions, although they were not from the people of the book. If we go to the next book in English, and I just read a short passage of the page, inshallah ta'ala, the viewers can access these PDFs online and read it. We find that the Islamic system of governance, this is another book by Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, where he mentions on page 14 regarding the jizya being taken for the non Ahlul Kitab. And then finally, the book here, which is a very variety of different translations from his books. It also mentions the point of this as well on page 14. Now, as I mentioned before, brothers, in the past, it's quite ironic because some people try to say that, say, Muhammad Shirazi, um, um, may Allah be pleased with him, was someone who is an extremist. And they say the same about Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi when they do not delve in and read any of their books. And this is an issue because they judge without reading any works from them. And actually when one looks at the opinions of Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, they see that he had quite moderate opinions. This, these opinions that he had were from his own research and of course he was a faqih. So I myself am not a faqih. I don't make rulings like this, etc., or give these opinions. Rather, I'm just quoting an opinion. And we go with this opinion of Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, as we say, it matches the overall spirit of Islam. But someone might come along and say, okay, now you're saying that jizya, if an Islamic state were to be established now, that those who are from non Ahlul Kitab have this option. Even if they are polytheists, even if they are mushrikeen, they don't just have the, the option of Islam and death because there are narrations within the Shia books that also mention something similar to this that there's nothing accepted from the Mushrikeen except Islam or the entering of Islam or fighting them so one may ask now what are the proofs 
that Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi used in order to conclude that jizya can be accepted for non ahlul kitab. Did he get this concept from his pocket or did he bring up certain proofs for this? Inshallah ta'ala what we'll do is that we'll go to Mawsu'atul Fiqh which is the jurisprudential encyclopedia of Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi which is over I believe 120 volumes and this is not translated in English so I had to take um, some of the points and pages of his and translate them in English to present them for the viewers. So inshallah ta'ala what we'll do is we'll go into this now and we will analyze some of the proofs that he gave. So we find that he discusses this issue in Kitabul Jihad. So Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, he discusses it in volume 48, um, part 2 of the uh, Kitab al-Jihad. What Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi says on page 28 and 29, he says, As for the matter of killing someone who isn't a Kitabi, who isn't from the people of the book if they don't convert, then there is no proof for that. Rather, it is clear that if Islam overpowers them, then they are left to their business and not killed. And verily the verses which speak about striking the necks are in the context of war based upon the following verse. So we have the following part of the verse in Surah Al-Muhammad, Surah Al-Muhammad which says, Hatta idha athkhantumuhum, where it says until you have overcome them. So what is his argument here? He says, the verse, let me read it inshallah ta'ala, he says, so when, Allah Azza wa Jal, so when you meet in battle those who disbelieve, then smite their necks until when you have overcome them. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying you've overcome these people and you um, have smited their necks because you're in the state of war. Some people say, oh, the Quran has violent verses. Look, this is barbaric. But if you are self-defending yourself in the state of war, are you going to go give a flower to the person? No, you have to defend yourself. And striking of the necks was one of the way that people would be in war which would kill the enemy quickly. And this is in the context of war, not killing random people. So the verse says, when you meet those who disbelieve in battle, then smite their necks until when you have overcome them. And then what options does Allah Azza wa Jal give in the verse? Then make them prisoners. So you make them prisoners and afterwards either set them free as a favor uh, or let them ransom themselves until the war terminates. So say Muhammad Shirazi, what does he say about this verse? You fight them until you've overcome them. They become prisoners. And then after that, what? You may you set them free as a favor or let them ransom themselves until the war terminates. He says, this is point one. If it was meant that you fight them until they become Muslim, then it would have been necessary for the verse to say, fight them until they become Muslim. So these mushriks that you were in war with, these polytheists, you have to fight them and you only stop fighting them until they become Muslim. But rather the verse doesn't say that. The verse says that you fight them until you've overcome them and it gives you options of, for example, setting them free or taking them as ransom. So Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, he continues, he says that, as for the narrations I've seen, so now what? He quotes narrations of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, about whether someone should be just killed like mushriks completely, unconditionally are just killed or they must accept Islam. He says, as for the narrations I have seen, I believe this narration it is either Imam Baqar or Imam Sadiq alayhim as -salam, but what I will do, inshallah ta'ala, um, to confirm, I'll put it on the screen if that's not correct. Um, he says, verily the narrations I've seen from one of the Imams, it says, verily he, so the defeated in war, becomes captive, pardoned, or is ransomed. So what do we say here, dear brothers and sisters, Say Muhammad Shirazi, according to Mawsu'at al-Fiqh, he says that if it was in Islam that you force them to become Muslim, you keep fighting them until they become Muslim, the verse in the Qur'an would have said that, but it doesn't say that. Secondly, we have in the hadith this concept of someone within war, defeated in war, becoming a captive or becoming ransomed or becoming someone 
who he has forgiven. So he is set free, he is pardoned. So these narrations are clear on this aspect, that it is not just the case that they are non Ahlul Kitab, you keep fighting them until they become Muslim. Inshallah Ta'ala, within the next episode, we will continue this discussion. And then finally, after that, we will go to the verse of Jizya and conclude our series, Inshallah Ta'ala. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum wa la'an a'adahum. Bil-Hasan, Bil-Hussain, Bil-Arimma, Bil-Abhar.